So with that uh, introduction about Devopedia, let me introduce the speaker for today. So today we are fortunate to have Anupama with us. She is a director of engineering at uh, WSO2. Uh, so the WSO2 is the company behind Ballerina, which she is going to introduce to us today. Uh, I believe it will be very much useful for people who are working in the field of DevOps or do any kind of integration work. Uh, so uh, Anupama is a well-known speaker. Uh, she's been speaking at many events uh, across the world, uh, meetup events or uh, conferences, talking about Ballerina and other related uh, cloud computing uh, stuff. And she has a master's degree in computer science and engineering from, from the University of uh, Moratuwa. So with that uh, brief introduction, over to you, Anupama. OK, thank you so much, Arvind, for the nice introduction, as well as giving some insights about Devopedia. Um, so good afternoon to you all, uh, if you all are joining from India, and good morning if someone is joining from the other part of the world. So let's start with the discussion. So let me share the my slides and screen quickly. Hope you can see the screen. Let me share the slides. Yeah, I can see the first slide. Yeah. Okay, nice. So, yeah, uh, as Arvind mentioned, I'm Anupama. I'm currently working as director of engineering at Lab So, too. So, a little bit about me. I'm currently leading the Balna development efforts, uh, and also I'm leading the developer relations aspect of Ballerina as well. And apart from that. I'm an open source contributor and developer in my multiple languages, including Java, C++, and so on. And I'm a Sri Lankan, currently based in Austin, Texas, US. Uh, so that's about me. Without further ado, let's go into the discussion. So without giving a background, I thought it's not fair to introduce Ballerina because we need to first understand what's the problem that we are trying to solve as well as uh, what what are the different options we have? So as you see in this diagram, uh, this is how the application architectures have evolved over the last couple of decades. So we in, in around 1980s, we had monolithic applications, mostly in mainframes, and those were physical servers. And later on, we had distributed applications, and we moved gradually to virtual servers and different kind of hosting mechanisms. And later on, or now mostly what we have is microservices or maybe any cloud related technologies. So application architectures have evolved significantly. And along with that, I would say the complexity of the applications or the nature of the applications also have evolved. So we need to adapt into that. That's one of the key things. And if you look at any type of applications that we develop today, it has a front end and back end. Although we sometimes think it's only the back end, Somehow it has some user connecting or front end part. It can be web, mobile, desktop, whatever, and also a back end. So that back end typically consists of multiple or bunch of APIs to, uh, so that the front ends can consume those APIs. And also, uh, when developing such back ends, we have to com communicate or con um, make sure that we are connecting with multiple other APIs or data sources or different connection points. That is inevitable, given that this distributed nature, as well as the current trends in the application deployments. So that is something that we have to face, and that is a problem that we are trying to solve. Actually, it's not a problem. It's something that we have to practice. It's that something we call integration. Integration, this is the definition of integration from Gartner, but in simple terms, it's like connecting multiple systems or applications, APIs, whatever, in a meaningful way to deliver the intention of our application. So these integrations can be very simple, something like your day-to-day, -day, uh, some automation, maybe sending an SMS alert based on some event in the calendar, specific type, something like that. Or it can be some enterprise scale integrations where you have to deal with multiple complexities, uh, different system integrations, application integrations, data integrations. There are a whole bunch of different kind of integrations when it comes to enterprise application development. So this is this problem is, oh, the, oh this integration thing is available in different scales. 
so that's a thing that we are trying to solve when if you are coming from the application development background whether it's integration or not usually when uh, when we decide on the initial steps of the application we have to decide certain things like the technologies that we are going to use what are the different uh, tool stacks that we are going to use what approach what is the current skill set of the team we have to decide all of these things before starting a project so this is an ai generated image to uh, uh, showcase that uh, that initial stages they are discussing on different approaches of building an integration product uh, in integration development world at the moment there are two approaches if we uh, categorize into two high level areas the first type or what you see in the left hand side is the diagram based one or what we call low code based approach where there are multiple ui elements where you can drag and drop or it can be some templates forms whatever so basically you work or interact with the ui uh, graphically to build your integration on the other hand what we have is the code first approach where you basically write the code to get your work done and with minimal or i would say sometimes zero ui capabilities so those are the two two extreme ends and uh, if we look at different uh, uh, aspects of these two approaches in low code first approach what we mainly use is user interface uh, there are so many products technologies for this approach and also there are different capabilities it can be drag and drop or just mapping form filling template based it can be anything and mostly in these applications we have a dsl underneath uh, domain specific language so that is what eventually it get it is generating and also those kind of applications are intended for teams or users with minimal coding experience. Basically, they can simply drag and drop and do the integration without uh, thinking about the code much. But still, when it comes to complex stuff, if we really want to do some complex thing using that, we still have to go to some sort of language to extend the capability through some mediator or some kind of functionality. We have to extend the capability. So we have to call out a different language or something like that. And the other approach is code first approach. There, what we do is we basically rely on programming languages and frameworks, usually the general purpose languages. And still, uh, the thing is, when it comes to the skill set, it requires skill developers uh, with coding knowledge, not exactly the language that we are going to use. But if if the team is comprised of set of developers, they can easily grab another language. And also sometimes code first approaches or those tools and technologies comes with some sort of toolings to help with time consuming or some boring tasks. So those are the two approaches. So how to select those two, uh, one out of these two approaches is totally depends on the nature of the problem or the right skill set, the composition of the team. Uh, the future of the application, maintainability, everything. So we have to consider everything when we design the right technology. So what we, what I'm going to do is kind of give some highlights or insights on how to select the right tool and what are the capabilities that we offer with Ballerina and uh, things like that. So if we look at code first integration a little bit further, both approaches has pros and cons, but if we look at the code first integration, it has certain advantages when it comes to enterprise level applications, because those code first approach is highly customizable. Whatever the code that you write, whether it's Java, Go, Python, C, C++, those code is very much flexible. You can do whatever you want with such a code, not restricted to a DSL. And also those type of things are very scalable and uh, you can use existing developer skills to develop your product without training the team into complete different um, technology or tool. And also it aligns well with the developer ecosystem. Like we have uh, all the languages have documentation, testing frameworks, and also CI/CD processors. Everything well, is well aligned if you are choosing code first approach for integration application development. And also if you are using open source technologies, uh, there's an advantage of uh, when no vendor lock-in because you are not locked into a certain vendor. You can use multiple open source technologies and you can do whatever you want to modify the stuff and so on. So those are the code first integration advantages. So that is the entry point. 
So let me introduce Ballerina. What, what are the advantages or where it fit, fits into and what capabilities we have? So Ballerina is all about integrations. Uh, but un, uh, if, in simple terms, if someone knows what is Ballerina, I would say it's a programming language. So at, at the moment you hear it's a programming language, tons of programming languages will come into your mind. And then I would say it's not just a programming language with a compiler and a language specification. It's a full framework. So that's a differentiator. And also it has, um, like, you know, there are many languages exist uh, in, in modern or any application development. We can choose any of them. But the thing is, they are general purpose programming languages. Sometimes some of the languages have specializations over some scenarios or some use cases. But at the same time, they are general purpose and they are not specifically focused for this problem of integration or solving integration problems or API creation. So that is where Ballerina comes in. That is, Ballerina is a language. It is also having same capabilities like any other programming language. You can write whatever the application you need, general purpose application using Ballerina. But the difference is it comes with the right set of abstractions to solve the problem of integration. The right, I'll talk about what is this abstraction means in uh, in couple of minutes, uh, but that that level of abstraction basically programming language doesn't shape the way that you think. It basically instructs the computer on what to do, but if the language provides some abstractions or some 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 more guidance to the developers to do certain things, that will be very much effective and that will help the developers a lot uh, when it comes to the effectiveness, maintainability, and everything. So Ballerina provides clean and clear abstractions as well as set of tools for integration development. And also it's not a, although it's a new technology or new new thing, uh, not, not that new because we released major version around two years ago, but still is a, it, it is using existing technologies. And also it's not a research project, it's used in production by many, many organizations, many enterprises, as well as it is not a research project and it's widely used and we have wide open source community around us who is contributing as well as using. So this, uh, since it is comes as a language, it has the language capabilities and all the flexibility that comes with the language. That is a value addition. It, it is not restricted to a DSL like uh, XML and so on. So if you look at history a little bit quickly, to give you some understanding where we started uh, it's an open source technology and it's developed by wso2 the company that i am representing for but still i'm representing the open source community of ballerina as well because in in uh, ballerina context we, we 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 give everything in free and it's a free and open source code and everyone can contribute use it without any any paying anything to wso2 or anyone and we WS2 is anyway specialized in integration for more nearly two decades now, uh, not just integration, API management, ID and access management and so on. But we were in this domain for two decades and we know the pain points, problems developers were facing. And uh, that's why we thought of introducing this technology or programming language or platform. And we started the work in 2016 and it went through multiple iterations and we released the first major version. That's what we call Balna Swan Lake in February 2022. So it has a lot of capabilities and I will go through those uh, in the upcoming slides and the demo. Uh, Ballerina provides the right abstraction. So, so that's a key thing. So if we look at what are these abstractions in high level, I can categorize those into three different areas. So first thing is data. So when it comes to network applications or integrations, data is the key thing. We can't forget about the data. It's not code, code is obviously there, but what we are exchanging between the applications or systems is data. So data plays a key role, different systems speaks in different data formats, and they we need to convert, transform, query, and we need to persist data, and we need to send it out again in a different format. And likewise, data plays a key role. So we need to have right set of abstractions, tools, type system support, and everything to deal with this complexity easily. And then the network. Network is inherent for any network uh, integration applications. So we need to have different communication protocol support, client services, uh, like that. So we provide those abstractions as well. And then concurrency. 
network applications are inherently concurrent. So we can't forget about the concurrency when we are talking about network interactions. So the application or the framework or the language or whatever, it should provide the right set of uh, semantics and other syntaxes or ways to mechanisms to write concurrent applications. That's anyway, they are in most of the languages, frameworks, and so on. And at the same time, Ballerina guarantees or provide extra layers for concurrent safety as well. Let's say you write a concurrent application and you think it's correct, but you when you run in the production, you will get some concurrency related issues like data races. At that point, finding or debugging such a thing, such a scenario is not very easy. And then Ballerina provides concurrency safety mechanisms by analyzing the data access or mutability uh, stuff of the variables and so on. It analyzes the code when you compile it and gives you warnings. Okay, there's a possibility of data raise or something, uh, concurrency issue if you run continue with this code. Likewise, it gives the concurrency related warnings as well, which is a great value addition when it comes to integration applications. So that's about a quick overview. And also feel free to ask questions anytime. Please interrupt me and ask questions, otherwise I'll continue. So as we give a quick overview, I would like to go to some hands-on stuff with Ballerina. So before starting, Ballerina, although it's a framework integration technology, it's a underneath the programming language as well. So we use VS Code to develop the stuff. We have VS Code plugin, and since it's a language or a programming, uh, it, it goes really well with the programming models, development methodologies. We can use whatever the source code version, control systems, or uh, CICD pipelines you have, and you can deploy it in Kubernetes or whatever the platforms you want. And you can do runtime monitoring or logging, those kind of aspects using any of the tools. Likewise, those flexibilities are there with a with lot of extension points as well. So let's start with the first application. So let me quickly. Uh, this is my terminal. I'm going to start a new ballerina uh, program. But before that, let me see how you can start if you are interested. Hope you can see my browser. Uh, so here, this is the ballerina website. This is open source, free, and everything. You can go to download page and download the latest ballerina version and install it. And we have a VS Code plugin as well. Uh, you can install the given uh, the specific VS Code plugin extension as uh, VS Code extension as well. So I have done those two things already. So now when I type the bell version, you can see the latest Ballerina version, version which is up, so on like update nine installed on my machine. And also uh, now let's uh, create a new Ballerina program. Ballerina comes with the command line tool as well. So I'm going to create a new uh, package, which is the entry point or the unit of uh, sharing, module sharing uh, in Ballerina. Uh, so I'm using new command to create a project. Let's say I'm create a hello world project. So that created uh, some files. Let's open it in the VS Code and see. So I'm opening it in the VS Code plugin now. Uh, this, I, I have already installed the Ballerina plugin. Uh, so you can see the Ballerina plugin is already installed in my uh, VS Code. So then if you look at the generated files, it created four files. So if you look at what are those four files, basically those four files uh, have some structure. Actually, the first thing is the dev container JSON. It doesn't have anything to do with Ballerina. It's a common file which uh, allows people to start the things in the dev environment, dev en the dev environment in a Docker container. And we have JTIG. No, it's also not Ballerina specific. It uh, allows to untrack certain files from the version controlling system. So the last two are the Ballerina specific things. The first one is a Ballerina TOML file, which is a metadata file file and also that is the file which identifies a given directory as a ballerina package if you do, if you have that file that means it's a ballerina package and also it contains certain metadata about your package and the build stuff and so on and the main.bal file which is a main, uh, ballerina file uh, source code file you can have one or more such files 
as you organize the code. So those are the four files. And if you open up the Ballerina main file, you can see it's just a simple hello world like any other language. And I can simply run it using this code lens and you will see the output in the terminal. It will compile the source code and uh, print this one out. You can see the hello world. So it's like a normal programming language in that context. And this is the TOML file, uh, which contains some metadata about the version, the naming and everything. So that's about creating a new package. So let's move ahead and do some little bit more interesting work when it comes to integration as well, because the one that I just did was a plain main program. It, it is not that interesting. So the demo that I'm going to do today is kind of a hypothetical scenario, a very much simplified version of the usual integration, enterprise integrations problem. But uh, let's say you are going to buy some subscriptions from a telecommunication provider, maybe a mobile SIM or some other internet package or something. Then what you do is you log into a telecommunication portal, the web interface of it maybe, and purchasing online, let's say. So then it has a web portal, and then uh, you select certain packages you need, one or more. It is an array then in that case, and then you send the request to the backend portal. Then let's say the backend portal is doing some calculation analysis and things like that for each of such uh, new package requests. And then it can do certain things like writing to database or uh, sending emails. It can do certain things. So this is the backend portal. This is the one that I'm going to develop today, the backend portal. And it's going to connect to the database only for simplicity and it can do any other things as well. And finally, it's going to return the confirmed packages, list uh, the details of the confirmed packages to the uh, person who is accessing this portal. So that's the scenario that I'm going to develop. I uh, hope time won't be an issue. It won't take much time. So let's see what the, what is the developer experience would be. So since I already created a package, I'm going to reuse it without creating a new one, although it's named as Hello World. Uh, name doesn't matter. You can give whatever meaningful name. Since I'm not interested in this main program, let me delete it because I'm going to write a service, backend service. So what I need to do is uh, write a service, which is an HTTP service. So in Ballerina, we have the support for many different services. It can be email, file, GraphQL, gRPC, Kafka, HTTP, web sub, web socket. There are so many protocols available in the uh, world today, and we are having support for such clients. So what you can do is you can start with such a service in the code editor, or else you can do the graphical version of the, the tool as well. So that's one important thing. For example, you can simply use the code editor and continue to do it. Uh, no, no change. Basically, if you're familiar with the code stuff or you are a developer mostly, you can do the code editing stuff because that's more natural for a developer. Uh, code snippet support and everything is there or else you can start graphically and then later on uh, continue with the code for the complex stuff. So let me uh, switch to the diagram mode in that case to showcase how it is going to look like if we start off with the diagram side. So what I'm going to start is a service. Uh, in Balna, we consider there can be three different kind of entry point. One is main program, which runs once. Uh, and execute exit and service is a long running thing which serves the other request and trigger is kind of a triggering based on some events. So what we are going to do today is a service. Let's provide the base path for this service. Let's say it's a telco uh, telecommunication service and we let's say we are running it in port 9090. You can change it. And once you save it, you can see the same code that I wrote earlier using the codes, suggestions and uh, snippets got generated automatically. So basically, it's you can start on either way based on your familiarity and it gets generated. So once you do that, the next thing that we have to do is define the resource functions. I will discuss a little bit about if time permits specifically about these syntaxes. But for now, let's continue what we see here. What we have generated is a service. So in Ballerina, those are the abstractions that we are talking about. Service is a very uh, language concept. Okay. Um, um, Let your life. Fuck off.
sorry, I think it's uh, some random noise. So service is a uh, first class concept in language. So you don't have to deal with the underlying network complexity, how to open sockets, how to make the connections, anything. So once you define a service, Balna will handle everything for you. So what you simply have to do is attach the given service with HTTP listener and it will do the rest for you. You can do the, you can define the port and that's it. So, you know, in the HTTP world, there are four or different kind of resources like a, get, post, delete, patch, and so on. So in our scenario, what we need is a post request because we are sending some information. We are accepting some information uh, from the web portal. So in that case, we need instead of get resource function, we need to make it a post resource. So what we can do is, uh, either you can simply let's say let's remove this auto generated one for now uh, and then let's add a new one we can add a resource we close these windows panels okay so you can select what is the method you want and you can give the path let's say packages is my resource path and you can add payload responses and so on uh, let's add Uh, let's say 200 OK for now. Or else we can simply return error as well. Uh, whatever it is, I will click. Uh, we can add, add, add it later as well. So I added a resource function, uh, which, acts, which is a post resource function with the name of packages. So your URL for such service will be, uh, if you try to invoke this, uh, first port slash telco packages. So this is, if you invoke this in your browser or curl command, this is the resource function which get invoked. So this is where you have to write the business logic and whatever other stuff. And let's quickly do that part. So to write the business logic, let me first analyze the payload. Let's have some hypothetical payloads uh, to simulate the usual development practices. So to do that, I'm copying some input payloads and output payloads. Uh, let me copy that some pre-generated stuff. I copied some stuff to my project uh, so that I can see all the things here. So these are the two things. Um, it, it added it uh, without a package actually since I copied the file level thing. So we have input JSON and you have output JSON. So if I move the output JSON to a separate uh, left right hand side, you can compare. Uh, so this is the input JSON. It has certain fields, it's a JSON uh, and customer service details, those are nested elements within the JSON and the output is a little bit different. Sorry, do we have any questions? No, oh, all good. No, no uh, questions. OK, so output is a little bit different. So that's the thing that we are going to do. Some data transformation, calculations, and then how to generate this different payload. So that's a task of our service. Let's do this one quickly. So this input JSON, we had to process this input. Usually, in other languages or frameworks, what we had to do is we had to do certain data binding things and you have to process this JSON, you have to access this field separately. It's kind of a nightmare or like very time consuming task if you have to write everything manually. In Ballerina, we provide certain capabilities. Uh, so instead of writing everything manually, now the task is to get this input payload into our resource function. So to do that, let's first define our input. So there, Ballerina, we have a concept called record. That is our canonical data format. Anything, XML, JSON, or whatever those input types can be converted to this record type. If you're familiar with C, it's a bit like structs uh, with some data type, name, and its collection of fields. So let's import it. Let's say the input, we are importing it as package request. And we have to provide a sample JSON if you have one already. And we can say make the nested record separately and let's save it. So you can see a bunch of records got created. It has a name. Uh, let me move this to the right hand side now. So you can see uh, this is the package request and it has ID. This is mapping through this one. 
and customer is the internal uh, nested element and service details. You don't have to write these fields manually. You still, you can do, but when it is a large JSON payroll, it's very hard to do that, which is the typical scenario in the enterprise applications. So these are the net nested records, which is corresponding to each of these nested elements. So we created those records instantly, and now we can simply use it. And then the next thing is, uh, creating the output payload. So let's rename this quickly to input and output. So these suggestions are coming from the copilot because Balna is a language, GitHub copilot support is also there so that it will auto generate certain code uh, blocks for you. And then the next task is to generate the output JSON schema or, or the output structure. Let me take that as well and it's simply creating another record. You can simply create the record using adim field one by one or by XML or JSON. Uh, let's name it as package. So if you go back to the main.val file, uh, it has created the output record as well. So this is the output. If you look at the output structure, it's completely matching. Uh, the output structure it has user service summary. These are the two internal records, and this is the outer record. So that is how we represent data in Balna. So that's what we mentioned as data abstractions as well. Dealing with data is very easy. Whatever the data format that you get, you can easily convert or create a record type out of it, and then continue to process that record instead of accessing JSON, XML, or convert them to here and there. You can simply use record as a canonical format and continue there. So now we are mostly done with the outer part of it. Let's quickly look at this records visual representation because it's sometimes uh, worth to have a look. If you go to the type diagram, you can see the relationship about these types as well. That's kind of which very much useful uh, when you are having a complex system. You can see this is the request path records. It is having some relationships. This is output paths. It has some relationships, things like that. So that is very useful when it comes to long term maintainability and under, when you are understanding a complex existing code. So now since we have defined the input and output payloads, it's just a matter of uh, adding those into the service. So let's go back. We can edit in the code level as well, but I'm editing in the diagram side now. You can add a payload. Now we have we can select the package request. And to be precise, it's an array. So let's add array here. And the response, let's say we we are sending, we created this package record. Uh, it's again an array. So that's what we are going to send. So now once you save it, you can see your service code has also updated. Uh, with the relevant source code. If you are familiar with the source code, you can simply write it in the source code without moving to the diagram side. So that is, you, you can see an error here because it says it is returning a package, but we are not returning anything now. So the simplicity or the abstraction here is services are very natural. You can read it in the way that you see in the URL patterns and so on. This is your base path. This is the uh, sub path and resource functions closely resembles the normal programming functions. You don't have to do anything explicitly. It has a type and it has a name. It has input as input parameters and it has return types like normal language, no, normal functions. And then even though you are dealing with network, you don't have to worry about these things. It is automatically handled. Now we get the re request. Now we have to process it. So these are the suggestions comes by Copilot, but I'm going to ignore it and show you how we are going to do it. So what we need to create is package array. That is the output that we are going to send out. So let's say packages, empty array. Uh, then uh, for each package, we need to convert it to the other payload because input and output structures are a little bit different. So that conversion we have to do. So there are some convenience mechanisms to do that as well. So let's first iterate the package request. So we have to iterate this package request. Uh, this is like a normal for loop in other languages. Uh, we are iterating the payload and then for each such request we go to transform. So to do that, I need to have a transform or that conversion function. So let's write a normal function. 
these are the code suggestions uh, snippets. I'm writing a normal function, but little bit different in terms of syntax because this is a data mapper function. Uh, I let's let me rename it to transform it. You can give any name, uh, but this is little bit different syntax than usual function. But usual function uh, only difference is like it's uh, this syntax, but it says it returns only single value. So this transform function should accept package request. This is the input type, input structure, and it should return output structure of this package. This this way, this type. So those records are already here. I already created. Let's add them. So the input type is the package request. Output type is the package. And let's save it. And it will give a nice data mapping view for you once you do that. So then it's just a matter of mapping fields manually. You can map here to here and first name. Let me maximize this a little bit. OK, uh, first name into the name. Last name into uh, first name and last name. We have to combine it to co make the name in the output field. Let's say it's a hypothetical combination. You can do the combination also like that. And address part is not mapping anywhere here. Service type is mapping here. Activation date is mapping here. Monthly fee. Uh, is not mapping here. Actually, can ex expiration date. An annual payment. I just want to do some calculation. That's why I added that field. Uh, so my annual payment is, let's assume, it's a combination of summation of the monthly fee into 12 for 12 months and the initial payment. So we had to combine those two fields. Just the combination will not work because it will just the summation of those two fields. But instead, I need to multiply it by 12 to make it 12 months. So I, add, I click on that line and came here to add the intermediate expressions as well. So I simply drag and created the connection and then modified using this expression editor to add further processing in between. Same goes here as well in the name. I need to add a space in between the first name and last name. So you need add operation and let's add a space. So likewise, you can do whatever intermediate processing as well while you are doing data mapping. So this is very easy when you have complex structures or multiple payload types, multiple input left hand sides to map into the right hand side and so on. So once you are done with that, uh, it will generate the. Uh, let me check what's the issue here. Yeah, I, I didn't map one field. It says missing one parameter, so phone number is required. So you have to map this one and this one as well. So once you are done with that, the code is auto generated. You can simply write the code in the left hand side as well by creating these values and structures, but it's much easier when it comes to larger payloads and so on. So now we are done with that function. It's a normal function. So now we can simply call that function to do the transform. Excuse me. Could you demonstrate yeah. auto map? Yeah, auto map is also kind of an experimental feature. Uh, it is, uh, let's say you don't have anything like this. Uh, and then you, if you click on this, it will automatically map uh, to demonstrate that. Let me quickly open a more complicated example here. Data map advanced. So this is a similar thing uh, where multiple record structures are there and we need to transform one type into another. So there what we can do is, uh, let's say similar thing, but with different structures and elements. If you do the auto map is AI based thing, it will automatically try to map the relationships for you. And then what will happen is uh, it will give the suggestions uh, and in between you have to edit if you need. For example, these kids ages, you can see it's a this is a hotel reservation similar to the one that I did. It has an integer array saying how many kids are in the given hotel reservation request, and it is getting mapped into number of kids as well as kids ages separately because number of kids can be derived from the kids ages. So likewise, you can do auto map and then edit. This is still experimental feature because it all relies on LLM models and everything underneath. There uh, is a uh, evolving feature, but it's much useful as well.
Thank you. Hope that clarifies your question, right? Yeah. So let me go back to our original solution. We can do the same auto map here as well. I didn't want to remove the uh, additional expressions that I added in between. So OK, now we are done with that. So that's now I created the package out of it and I added it to the packages array as well so that I can return it. So like in a normal function, now I can return the packages. So this is the package array comes here. And the next thing that we have to do is write it to the DB. For every record, let's say we need to write into the DB. So do that. Uh, write to DB. I need to create a database client. So that's support in Ballerina. We have a lot of uh, connectors to different SaaS providers as well as platforms, message brokers, databases, and things like that. So you can simply select the connector you want. You can search and find it. And let's say you want MySQL. I'm using the MySQL package because underneath what I have is a MySQL uh, database. Uh, so there, once you select it, it is asking what fields you need to include when initializing. Let's say I need host, user, password, database, uh, and port, and I save it. And once you go there, you can see the connection is added. This is the DB client. So let me simply rename it to DB. So that's much easier. Then, then it's a matter of providing the values. You can either hard code here or else you can use configurable variable concept in Ballerina. So configurable variable is configurable string uh, first. You can provide because usually these values are we have to externalize events, passwords. We should not hard code. So likewise, we need to get these values externally either via environment variable or configuration file and so on. And uh, the configurables are where variables are the is the way to do that. So instead of providing these hard coded values, let me quickly add configurable values for each of them. Uh, this is co uh, GitHub Copilot, which is suggesting the rest of the code for me. So now instead of here, I can write host user password database and port. So this means we have to get these values externally. Question mark means it's mandatory or else you can provide a default value here like this uh, or else if you if the question mark is here, that means when the program is running, you have to provide it externally. So let's try to run this uh, or, or let's try, let's include the DB call as well. So the last thing is uh, execute a DB operation. Uh, there, let me show you the DB first quickly. So uh, this is the database. Its name is Telco. It has a table call package with three columns, and I'm going to write the incoming payload into this database. So to do that, uh, let's go back to the code. We had to execute a query, uh, insertion query. Let me quickly copy it from my previous example to save the time. Uh, this is the query part. Insert a simple, simple SQL query uh, with the insertion. And it's inserted into that table, those three fields. And these are the placeholders for values. Uh, similar to prepared statements in Java. You, uh, this is what we have in Ballerina. You can provide values and it's uh, preventing SQL injections in underneath. You don't have to worry about those things. And now it gives an error saying um, return, there should be a return value because if this is like a normal function call. I have to create a variable. So you can see in Ballerina there are union types. So this function call can return either the result of the execution or error. That's a normal thing in Ballerina because we don't have exceptions like most of the languages because exceptions means when you get an error, you just throw it and forget about it and you, won't, you, are, you are not explicitly dealing with it. But as integration developers, our best practice is you have to deal with the errors. You have to handle it properly without throwing or without forgetting after throwing. So that's why uh, every function calls that can return errors should return the error to the caller. So sometimes, you may not really want to handle this error. You can simply use check expression in Ballerina and pass that responsibility to the caller. That means uh, there's a missing semicolon here. 
that means you are passing the responsibility for the calling function to handle this error check is a keyword for that so here now it is giving an error because it says this is like a normal function i'm returning the error using the check keyword but this function signature doesn't contain the error so although this is a http resource function i can simply treat it as a normal function and return the error like this so now the error is gone and it gives another warning saying this variable is not used we don't really need it it's just an execution status for this scenario i don't need it so i simply use underscore to ignore that variable because i'm not going to use it so likewise balina is having some compiler level warnings and other stuff to make sure that we write the correct code we don't have any uh, idling variables and things like that and error handling is explicit you have to carefully handle it log it or do whatever that you will need to do with or pass it to the calling function to handle it and uh, error handling is complicated area that i don't have time to cover it but it's something like that so this is the final thing i think we are good to proceed and i'm removing this import because i removed some of the code here by underscore that now we don't need it these imports are the ones which provide these are official imports official ballerina packages comes with the ballerina that's what i call platform ballerina comes with all these capabilities in terms of packages so that is how the package important import happened in the code level this is the mysql thing that i imported from the ui side uh, in the code level it comes as an import so now we are all good to run this application uh, let's run it when you are running it it says the configurations are missing because i added some configurable variables you can run it but it will fail at runtime or else you can create the configs uh, it create a config.toml file for you so you can write uh, the let me quickly write my db credentials here simple test database uh, telco okay all good now let's run it again that will that should start the service in the port 9090 first it will compile the service uh like as this is a normal application and it's running so now let's execute this we have tried service uh the try it tool which is which is more like a swagger editor that you see in the other places you can try it with the payload let me quickly take a payload which is array uh this is much interesting to have an array multiple such payloads let me close this window as well okay uh, let me paste it so this is a payload let me execute it hopefully it should give the answer yeah so this is a converted result that simplified version of the output which is the different structure and uh, application has gave the right answer now let's look at the db we didn't have any records earlier now it has five records because the input has five elements in the array so this is kind of a very quick demo of the application so the diagram capabilities helps the data mapper and other stuff helps a lot service design especially so what what the usual developer flow is you can de uh, define the architects and other people or maybe high level developers can define the skeleton in the service designer uh, this view uh, add more resources as needed and so on and then hand it over the, to the developers uh, to in, write the internal logic business logic so that is where the combination of tooling as well as the um, other uh, code related approaches blend together so we have the vs code feature called sequence diagram as well every ballerina program you will get a sequence diagram without doing anything so this is the sequence diagram that i got for my application this is more or less the same sequence diagram that i show in the demo slide uh, which is explaining the scenario so if you have such a big scenario interactions multiple interactions it will give more actors more interactions it's very easy to understand it's like a flow chart in a given actor well it's a concurrent programming language so there can be multiple such actors in a given actor it's a flow chart and when the such multiple actors are interacting together there will be arrows here and there for those interactions and that fits nicely with the network interactions as well as those are external actors you can see the db here which is external party you can see the execution here likewise you get this diagram capabilities without any price and also you can add stuff from here as well if you really want to edit 
don't want to edit the code, you can go ahead with here as well. It will generate the code on the left side without any delay. So that is how we maintain the parity. So without any additional thing, you will get all these things. So let me show you some little bit more interesting example with multiple such resources. So this is a some similar service, but with multiple resource files. You can see this is the service designer. Uh, I, I developed just one post resource function, but this has many. And uh, you can see how it looks like. And service designer, you can add more resources. Uh, those are the service designer capabilities. It is not just HTTP. Uh, for example, let's say you are developing a GraphQL application. So this is a GraphQL application. Uh, same service syntax. The difference is instead of a HTTP listener, we are using a GraphQL listener. And still we have the same resource function concept here. What you need to deal with is the underneath or business logic. So if you visualize this one, uh, this GraphQL service, this is another package with some well files, multiple records and so on. Little bit complicated than the demo I did uh, because it has many records and so on. This is the visualization of your GraphQL service. So you can see the GraphQL service. What are the available uh, request uh, different resource types? What are the different data types? How those are interacting? Things like that. So this is very interactive diagram and you can edit or design from scratch as well. And the next thing I want to show, show you some little bit interesting sequence diagram. So this in our demo scenario, we had only one interaction, but here we have the GitHub connector as well as G sheet connector. You can see without even looking at the code, you can simply understand this program is interacting with GitHub and get some pulls and then extract that some information, loop it, and then write to a Google sheet. You can understand what your program is doing, no matter how complex your application is, you will get this diagram. And the next thing I wanted to show is uh, data map I already did. Yeah, so one last thing about is, let's say you have a lot of, uh, um, lot of complicated scenario, a lot of big project where you have multiple services. This is a shopping cart uh, demo scenario. It has multiple ad service, cart service, checkout service, email service, multiple such services the one similar to the one that I developed right now. So if you have such a scenario, having that overall view is also very difficult. So then here it gives a very nice overview. That is what we call architecture diagram. Uh, let me go to the level one. It says it is a HTTP front end service. We that is uh, this, let me collapse this. Uh, front end. This is a front end service. It says it's HTTP one, and then there's a gRPC service called add service, and bunch of such gRPC services, and finally some email endpoint. So this is a high level overview of your entire system. And then if you go to the resource level, it says HTTP service has this many resources, and this given post resource is connecting to. If you can see this, it is highlighting in yellow color. Not sure whether you can see it. Uh, let me maximize it a little bit. So it shows what are the interactions and so on. And uh, you can further drill down to the type system level as well. This is very, it has many records and that's why you get a big diagram. Uh, what are the different interactions, different record types and so on. So that's very kind of high level overview of the language and the capabilities. Let me go to, I, I covered this stuff as uh, this is a normal language. We have all the type system support and everything. One important thing is we have XML and JSON also as a types in Ballerina so that if you get such payloads, integration world, it's very common. You can deal without adding any other libraries or so on. Uh, I will not go through these details. Those are the things that I covered already, like the type system support. Uh, it has various features to control various null operations, uh, open open uh, open close principles and things like that those are a little bit complicated stuff i don't have time but these are the xml json uh, access conversions how you treat them in ballerina this is like normal variable declaration xml json both you can access using dot notations and also we have query support very powerful one similar to the sql queries let's say you have iterable collection like array or map or uh, table or something like that you can simply iterate using the query language in the language itself without right complicated logic to handle where closes order by stuff and so on. 
and the network abstractions we already talked about services and we have client concept as well that's what we saw in the database connector as well as the g-sheet connector uh, we have a lot of such connectors and concurrency is a first principle in ballerina we have a concept called strands and threads those are kind of lightweight threads uh, ballerina is a concurrent programming language it allows us to handle a uh, concurrency program. It has concurrency program construct to start things asynchronously using start keyword and also worker concept to run things parallelly. And also uh, with the isolation concepts in Ballerina, it guarantees the compile time safeness as well. It gives certain warnings and things like that. And visual capabilities, I think I already covered the service designing part, uh, REST, GraphQL, uh, this parity graphical lens syntax te uh, text syntax parity you always maintain whatever the program that you write you will get the diagrams without doing anything else data transformations are much easier and data persistence capabilities are there i didn't touch it uh, it's more like orm capabilities in java uh, you don't need to write sql queries in my demo i write the insert query but with the persistence, you really don't need to write queries at all. You can use uh, the records in the language to persist directly into the database as well. So this is the architecture design view, which gives high level overview of your uh, services or project. It has three levels, uh, resources, le uh, first thing the service level, the second one is the drill down version of it uh, the, into the resource level, and then the type diagram. And also, since it's a language, you can debug your integration like any other programming language. It debug your application. You can simply put a breakpoint in the editor and debug it. And one last thing about uh, Valerina is the packages. If you really write something that should be shareable, you can simply go to the central.ballerina.io. Uh, it's uh, our package sharing uh, platform. This is the central. Uh, there can be multiple packages. Uh, this is HTTP. This is officially released package. Likewise, anyone can publish packages. You, you just simply have to sign in. No need to pay or anything. If you have shareable code in Ballerina, you can simply share it with others. So that is one uh, easy way to share your reusable code. That Those are the things that I imported in my library. But in Ballerina, we say it's a platform because we have more than 1,000 packages we officially support for different protocols, different utility functions, different SaaS applications to connect with them, and databases, messaging queues, and so on. So this is the Ballerina official library part of it. We have a uh, lot of connectors for ex uh, external applications as well, because in the integration world, we had to connect with a lot of enterprise applications. So we have connectors for all of them. It's much easier to connect, and we have support for almost all the uh, different protocol types, services, clients, and so on. Uh, integration tools, I will not have much time to cover, uh, but uh, if you have one or two minutes, I can show one last thing. Uh, so the one code that we developed already, uh, let's go to that quickly. This is the one. Let me open the terminal back. Let me stop the service. So this is uh, the service that we developed. Let's say you want to share that with external team who is developing the api other capabilities so you have to have the open api specification for that for your service so you can use bell open api tool with the input uh, where is your services main.val is my service file name so this tool will generate the open api specification for you so that is very easy so you can see that file is generated uh, it contains all the usual open API specification stuff, parts, responses, codes, uh, the types, properties of the schema, everything. You can simply share it even hey, once you're writing the business one. logic. Okay. You're a salt. Let's back. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, that's about the tool. Likewise, we have a lot of integration tool for different protocols. This is for HTTP and uh, the open API stuff. And we have GraphQL, GRPC tools to deal with those uh, schemas. It is not just generate out of the code. We can do both sides. If you have open API specification, we can generate the Balna code. Similar to, similar to uh, same thing can be done for the GraphQL or GRPC schemas as well. So those are the integration tools. And uh, the last thing is about the deployment. Let's say you build this 
earlier I ran it without building. You can, it's an intermediate step, but you can simply build it using the uh, cloud command so that you can deploy it anywhere, whether it's a uh, Kubernetes cluster or whatever, the cloud platform. Uh, usually the, there is a gap between developers and DevOps. Uh, they have to, once you hand over the application to DevOps people, they have to write the development artifacts, the deployment files, YAML files, Docker files, and everything. But in Ballerina, we have easy way. You can either provide the flag as Kubernetes or Docker or other cloud platforms like Azure and so on. It will generate the relevant artifacts. Since I use Kubernetes as the output uh, cloud artifact, you can see the Docker file generated as well. It's totally by analyzing the code. You don't have to provide anything explicitly. It analyzes the ports and everything in the code and uh, load the dependencies as well. And in Kubernetes also, it created the services YAML, uh, the specs with all the default values. You can see some default values here. If you want your application to come up with a specific value instead of default value when you run this command, you can add a config file called cloud.toml where you can specify these things. Otherwise, uh, some of these parameters will be defaulted if you don't provide anything. So those are the cloud capabilities. Uh, this is what we have in the slide. Docker and cloud commands are there. You can simply take those artifacts and then deploy in whatever the cloud environment. That's why we call it a cloud native language. We have a lot of capabilities related to the cloud. And it's not just uh, those stuff. We have Azure function support, AWS Lambda support as first class things. If you really want to deploy as function as services, and observability is built in. Every Belna program is observable. You can connect to any of these tools or any other thing because we are using open tracing and uh, practices internally. You can connect to any of your existing tools and monitor your runtime uh, production application. Uh, same with logging. Yeah, so finally, so I covered most of the things and uh, in the demo as well as uh, other scenarios. Uh, since it's a language, as I mentioned before, it comes with a VS Code plugin and editing debugging capabilities. Additionally, we have tooling support for various protocols, and we have API doc automation. Uh, doc, doc, API documentation is automatically generated, and same goes with testing. You can create tests and uh, write normal tests like any other language. And we have sophisticated language library in the central. You can use connectors there. Uh, so it's a full platform, not just a compiler. So advantages in high level. It will save your time a lot uh, in terms of efficiency, maintainability, uh, and, and also when it comes to network applications, you don't have to deal with underneath network complexities. Well, now we'll handle those things for you. And so that in the long run, it will help you a lot. So uh, finally, we have a wide community with us. We are doing technical talks, trainings, university programs, uh, and, and we are attending conferences. We are hosting conferences. We are providing hackathons. We did a couple of hackathons this year as well. So we have a lot of events happening every month. Uh, this is purely on open source community. We are active open. We have active open source community. You can join with us in Discord, Stack Overflow, anything. Uh, we provide answers, and our community members are providing answers if you have anything. And also, we do very. Uh, wide university engagement programs as well. We provide many research options, open source contribution capabilities, mentorships and everything. All these are uh, as part of open source initiatives because it's a free and open source project anyone can use and contribute without extra pay. So that's about, that's all I wanted to cover today. So these are some pictures from our events, university programs and so on. Uh, so feel free to join with us in our community. Happy to have you all uh, in our community. So thank you so much for listening for me. I took more time than expected. Uh, sorry oh, about that's it. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it was a very wonderful talk, and uh, the tool is just as equally interesting. So anyone has any questions? I, uh, Nikhil already asked a couple of questions. Go ahead if you have any further. Let me get started. Uh, yeah, because it's open source, any uh, plan to approach CNCF Foundation or yes. any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually, uh, WSO2 is already having connections with CNCF, and uh, we, we do certain things with CNCF as well. Uh, 
we we still in the process of negotiating because we we have to go through certain process and that incubator programs and other things. So definitely, it is. Um, we 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 are considering it, but not yet there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we participate in a. Uh, uh, KubeCon and everything, and we, we do uh, active engagements there in that community, but we are yet to add it as a listing in the landscape. Right. My second question is, you mentioned uh, you have uh, your ballerina by default is providing 600 plus packages or something yes. you called. Yeah. So these are like plugins or they get installed by default as a yeah. out of the box? They got installed out of the box. You basically the platform when you install it, it comes with the minimal set, like the minimal util libraries, uh, and minimal set of uh, package uh, like uh, protocol packages uh, when you install it. But when it comes to connectors, there's a wide array like tons of connectors for external things. Then what you have to do is either in the code level, you have to add that import statement. So when you build the package or when you import it, what will happen is like in the background, VS Code tool will uh, pull it from the Ballerina Central. Uh, okay. Or then it, it comes on the fly when you add it. Okay, okay. So that is like in your example, you are using MySQL driver. Exactly. So it would have pulled it from the central Central, because my SQL is not coming by default because it's kind of yeah. vendor specific. So yeah. when I use it, it comes from the central. Only thing that you have to do is at the import statement or in the UI level, you can search it and add it. And uh, this uh, pulling it from the central repo, it happens on every project, right? Every project, yeah. And yeah. and we have a local cache as well. Not specific, okay. exactly, okay. not every product project. Uh, if you have multiple projects, that local cache will be used based on the versions used by. We have version resolution mechanism, and that's a bit of complex thing because every library version is have its own uh, independent life cycle. Uh, so we have to match the version of the installed Balana version as well as the library latest version and so on. So that version resolution happens in the central itself. Uh, somehow it get pulled into the your local cache in your machine and. In the the version available in the local cache, if that is matching, there will be no additional pull to the central. Uh, it will use the existing local cache version. Right. Yeah. So thanks for that. Uh, so my uh, one co one comment I have, I don't know if it is relevant. Yeah. So a lot of uh, integration people, DevOps people, you know, they deal with some of these things like integrating different services. So I believe some of them may not be from a developer background, so they may not be comfortable writing code. So there, I think the graphical view makes sense. Exactly. So they might find that kind of an approach easier to deal with than writing code. Yeah, exactly. So like, like in Postman, for example, if you want to test API, you know, the whole thing is very graphical and then it will give you some generated code as, as well. Exactly. So yeah. I see some parallel here for non-developers. It may be a good starting point. Yeah, that's why we always maintain the parity between the diagram as well as the code view. So anyone can start in whatever the approach they want and they can continue. Uh, and whatever the syntax we add, whatever the new language we add, we make sure that both sides are uh, comparable. Yeah. yeah. So I, I just two days back, I was taking a class from for some students Python class. Mm -hmm. So then I was showing them the TOB index, which is the index mm. which shows the popular programming yeah, languages. Language. Yes. So then if I go, if you scroll down, Ballerina is also there in that list. Yeah. But so it's not in the top 20, no doubt, but the it's top. there. Uh, it is there yeah. being, being covered in that list. So I was, exactly. Yeah. So the thing is like it, we, we were there in the official release version just for two years. And you know, programming language is like a religion for everyone. You, normally yeah. people won't change. So it takes time to come into the popular indexes and everything, but we are gradually getting there. Um, but it might take time, but still uh, underneath, uh, this is used by a lot of WC2 customers, uh, it, but it is not only for customers because we have open source community and same version, even our customers are using the same open source versions. Although we provide some additional support to write their code and stuff as part of WSO2 subscription. Other than that, it's uh, the same language platform and everything is free. So yeah, it takes time, but uh, we are gradually getting there. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Uh, do you have any uh, anything to talk about the performance? Yes, performance is actually um, performance numbers. Uh, I can show some of the numbers, but in in that it might take time. But uh, the thing is, like uh, right now, the ballerina is written in Java. So we have the same performance as Java. If you write a similar application in Java, we have the same uh, performance like Java. And also, to be precise, Balna is a, not a JVM language because the current implementation is done in Java and we are working on the native Ballerina version where we is generating the right platform uh, uh, architecture, uh, artifacts related to the platform architecture of any other platforms as well. So we have the Graal VM support as well, so that even though Right now is Java based artifacts. Still, you can port it to whatever the other platforms. So just to be just to compare with some known things, if you compare with Java, we have the same performance as Java. And uh, when it comes to integrations, uh, what we found with our customers and everyone, that level of performance is satisfactory because there are IO delays, network delays, and everything with in integrations. And uh, that performance is totally fine. Uh, for any complex applications in the integration world, because we are not writing CPU intensive or com computational intensive applications, where we might need Python or such languages for such things, data processing and stuff. Uh, but for a language like Ballerina, with the intention of integration, we provide the same comparable performance like Java. I can see that uh, at least on GitHub, most of the, uh, I mean, there's percentage of uh, Ballerina itself is more than Java, so is it, is it in the bootstrapping process? Yes, uh, we have in the bootstrapping process. Uh, initially, it was everything in Java, but then gradually, we, while we evolved, we bootstrapped most of the stuff, including compiler, some parts of it, and even all the libraries are written in Java. Uh, some, most of the, I would say, eighty percent of the libraries are written in Ballerina now. So we are bootstrapping things. Uh, are there plans of uh, having the capability to call into other languages? Uh, calling to other languages in the sense uh, invoking other languages, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, we we have it right now for the Java. If you have any Java library or anything, you don't have to do anything. You, we have a tool called BindGen tool. You can simply invoke that tool to bring your existing Java code to work with your Ballerina code. That support is there, but we don't have any other plans to port it to any other languages uh, right now it's java only and the plan is to continue as it is but the thing is since it's an integration uh, if you have any other services written in other languages or any other libraries you can expose them as simply a service and invoke using ballerina if network delay is not a significant thing in that case uh, but if you really have a library that should be invoked within your source code that support is only there for java okay thank you yeah,